Welcome to Pennsylvania in Focus. I'm Kristen Smith, Pennsylvania editor for the Center Square. Joining me today is the Center Square's Pennsylvania reporter, Anthony Hennon. So let's get right into it. The General Assembly was really busy this week, especially in the House where we've been having drama unfold since swearing in day on January 3rd. And something big happened this week that you reported on. In fact, we're one of the first Pennsylvania outlets to report on. And that is who became the new House Majority Leader. Will you tell us all about it? Yeah, so this follows two months of uh, drama, frustration, subterfuge, if you will, where uh, Democrat Mark Rossi rose to become Speaker of the House. You know, this uh, people were not expecting this to last long. Generally, people had expected Joanna McClinton to become this, and then Rossi kind of stepped in as a compromise candidate. After recent elections, that gave Democrats an outright majority in the House. Tuesday came up and Rossi quickly resigned, deferring to uh, McClinton. And so they quickly held a vote. I mean, all this happened essentially over, I believe, about an hour on Tuesday. Rossi got up, gave a resignation speech, um, and then they had a quick vote and joined a 102-99 over the Republican choice of uh, Representative Carl Metzger. But th- this is, by all accounts, a historic change here. McClinton is the first black woman to hold the position. This has been something that uh, has been relatively expected for a few months now. McClinton hasn't actually been in the House all that long. Um, she rose to it in 2015, but what she, you know, ever since then, she's run unopposed in the primaries and in general elections coming out of the seat in Philadelphia. So yeah, it's uh, it's a big shift here. Looking at Rossi, who was viewed a little more as more of a moderate compromise Democratic choice, McClinton is seen as more you know more progressive than Rossi would be. So this could change the tenor of the House. The House now has rules established to follow and actually take action in. But it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. McClinton spoke of sort of uh, bipartisan and trying to accomplish something together, asking her Republican colleagues to give her a chance. How long that goodwill will last is yet to be seen. Um, Rossi also began his tenure very optimistically and, and speaking in these high flutin terms, but that quickly disintegrated. So you you spoke a little bit about it, but now with McClinton as House Speaker, do you have any sense of what their top legislative priorities are for the coming session? I know last week they did the special session where they passed, or earlier this week, I should say, they completed the special session where they passed uh, the bills pertaining to child sex abuse statute of limitations reform. But with that out of the way, what can they turn their focus to? Did McClinton give any um, hints as to what that might be? Uh, Well, it's... uh... It's kind of hard to say. Um, McClinton's acceptance speech f- very much focused on you know her gratitude for what happened on Tuesday, um, referencing you know people who are important in her life and in her political career. Um, you know she uh, she basically also re- tried reaching out to Republicans, essentially saying, um, "Give me this chance and the opportunity to do the work off the floor to get to know you, to find out what your priorities are." Um, so to to a certain extent, some of this is at least uh, rhetoric looking not necessarily at just a Democratic checklist, but also where they can find some overlap among Republicans. Um, So that that could, you know, give some hope of things won't simply be a list of partisan things um, and things that won't actually get come to pass or get accomplished, especially with the Senate being run by uh, Republicans. Um, But she also, I mean, she spoke of prioritizing equality, um, saying that uh, they'll stand up against every form of discrimination. Um, they have rules that protect uh, women, people of color, uh, LGBTQIA+, um, and referencing you know Pennsylvania as a birthplace of democracy. Um, but aside from that, as far as policies, policy specifics, um, she, she, wanted, she was fairly light on that in her speech. So this will sort of be something that turns out from you know, where we see Democratic leaders talking in the next few weeks and what they're really going to prioritize. I think, too, one of the things that might point to some of her intentions for the party revealed themselves in the rules package that was eventually adopted. So one of the interesting things is the way that the House wants to treat constitutional amendments in the future. Uh, For many of our listeners who have been paying attention for the last couple of years, The Republican-controlled House and Senate often use constitutional amendments to kind of get around former Governor Wolf's policies. He was considered more progressive when the pandemic happened. He had very intense shutdowns and restrictions that Republicans really hated. And because of, you know, existing structure of the government, they were often left unable to really do anything about it. So they would pass these constitutional amendments in quick, quick succession, get them on a primary ballot often, and 
they had some success with this, uh, most notably when voters pretty, you know, by a very comfortable margin approved a constitutional amendment that would limit the governor's emergency powers. And so the idea that a governor could ever again shut down the entire state for months at a time like had happened is by the wayside now because of that constitutional amendment. So House Democrats wanted or have made the rule change that number one, constitutional amendments have to be limited to a single subject. This goes back to prior reporting where Demo- or where Republicans wanted a constitutional amendment that had three different questions about three different issues. And not only do they have to be limited to a single subject, but they can only appear in a November general election ballot. Uh, their argument was these are more widely attended, more there's bigger participation rates, more people have the opportunity to vote on these amendments. So I think that kind of hints to what's been going on over the last couple of years and how they hope to change it. Mm-hmm. There's also, you know, the balance of, you know, the the panels or the, the committee membership instead of being 15 majority, 10 minority, which really gives the minority par- par- party no say at all. I believe it's 12, 13. It's a much narrower yeah. split than it was before. So I, I would, I think that that that's also too where you're getting some of the hints of what the future may hold. But you're ac- absolutely right; it could all be in vain because Senate, Republicans still comfortably control the Senate. Yeah, I think it it will, uh, if nothing else, I think it'll be a good test of whether these slim margins result in compromise and a you know a shift in priorities, or if it just results in uh, some more gridlock. So this will be a, a fun or a, a frustrating uh, little experiment we have in Pennsylvania. You can say that again. Well, thanks for joining me today. Listeners can keep up with this story and more at thecentersquare.com. For Anthony Hennon, this is Kristen Smith. Please subscribe and thanks for listening. Freedom and liberty are important to all of us. If you're looking for civil, intellectual conversations with those shaping the future of freedom, try the Future of Freedom podcast with me, Scott Bertram. We speak with leaders across the country in the greater conservative and libertarian movements. In-depth conversations about where the next intellectual battles will happen across the country. It's the Future of Freedom podcast. Find it at americastalking.com or wherever you get your podcasts.